Hare Krishna going through. Welcome back to the Monks podcast. Hare Krishna, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. My pleasure to be yes, back sir. with you. Thank you. Yes. So, Prabhu, now I, the world is uh, currently dominated with the news of the war. Mm. So, between primarily between Ukraine and Russia and Ukraine. So, I thought we could discuss uh, the causes and uh, solutions uh, for war uh, from a from a dharmic perspective mm. and i thought we could broadly discuss three things you know one is more like the more like analyzing warfare from a from a contemporary or a mundane perspective mm. and then there is also in terms of often spiritual perspective we may say that people are not self satisfied with that. that's why there is war but how mm. valid is that perspective in a in a in a contemporary sense or in a in dealing with the real world mm. So basically, those two aspects of causes of war, and then in terms of the solutions, what can we as individuals or as members of a spiritual group do, and what can be done in the world broadly to to decrease the possibilities for at least large scale wars. Hmm. So yes. that's okay for you. So the first yeah. thing I thought is that. Uh, there is uh, when the war occurs the news becomes dominated with uh, uh, with you know, this person is the aggressor this person is bad and uh, there is this uh, tendency in the when the contemporary analysis happens that okay this this uh, this side is right and this side is wrong mm. and then there are others who say actually no side is right you know everybody is doing their own spin doctoring mm. and everybody has their narrative and whichever narrative wins that is considered to be the that is considered to be that is the side which we consider to be right mm. so basically there is a tension in say today's world which often supports you could say moral relativism mm. there is there is no right or wrong mm. but at the same time in general at the time of war people start using moral language very strongly mm. you know this for this side is this side this person is evil or mm. this side is evil mm. this side is terrible so in some ways if you look at the, uh, the wars that are described in the mahabharat and the ramayan and general dharmic texts there is a side of virtue and there is a side of vice mm. so but of course we can say in the mahabharat nuances things quite a bit mm. in terms of in terms of showing that nobody has like a flawless character that even the good people do sometimes bad things and the bad people are not bad side is not entirely bad so broadly speaking you know how much in today's world can we analyze contemporary wars in ethical terms in terms of virtue and vice is such a analysis uh, useful and in fact and first of all is it useful and first of secondly is it quite dif- it's quite difficult with the Im- information overload to know who is actually virtuous and who is not any thoughts on this yeah so basically the foundational principle of life you know whether you take brindavan leela or you take on ordinary gali in a situated in a, any streets of india gali gali right gali was okay. yes right in ali yeah yeah so there is this foundational principle of life operating that there is a there are people who are living together like braj and suddenly then outside element comes and disturbs and the brajbasis headed by krishna they show violence against the intruders okay now because it is done by krishna we call it as leela but what does krishna do krishna uses the same principle the laws of life and makes into a sports similarly okay. if you come to any village or any alley when an outside force comes the villagers become disturbed and if the outside force is more aggressive then they turn violent violent towards them so okay. therefore therefore violence is not the goal of life but it is an integral part of life unfortunately mm. and nobody can deny this 
So it's mostly like more a matter of uh, what is the best way to deal with the reality of violence. Yes. Mm. No. So that is the first principle because, and therefore, in Sanatan Dharma we see. I think we had discussed this before. Bhima spoke to Yudhishthir. He said, "My dear brother, other than Brahma ji, everybody has weapons in their hand, and because Brahma ji doesn't have weapon in his hand." therefore it doesn't have a temple he doesn't really he okay. so bhima ji bhima makes this logic so he says therefore danda is as an integral part of life as much as compassion you cannot separate punishment from compassion and compassion cannot be separated from discipline they are integral part Oh, okay. Therefore, anybody who says, "Oh, you know, people are greedy," even the good people, in the name of philosophy, also they fight. Huh? Okay. So the war, what is war? War is nothing but, you know, collective conflict which is happening on an individual, individual life, become intensified. And turns into a bigger war. Okay, yeah. Ultimately, it is individual people with some influence who spread the ideas and ideologies that lead to war. Yeah. So, and we can say that interpersonal conflicts or interpersonal differences are always going to be there, yes. and those will also escalate at times. and that's how when it is escalated that turns into a war so 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 are you saying that we that before we even we look at terms of virtue and vice or saying that one side is virtuous and other side is is vicious we need to recognize that even if the two sides may be virtuous still differences and conflicts may still be there is that what you are trying yes. to say overall yeah so therefore in the maha in the in the in this uh, jaimini bharat Jaimini Bharat is an extra portion of Mahabharat. Jaimini Rishi wrote there. The interesting part of that Mahabharat is Pandavas are actually having a war against the Vaishnavas only. Two Vaishnavas are fighting with each other. How Pandavas? come? Yeah, because the Pandavas were performing supposed to perform uh, Ashwamedha Yagya as directed by Lord Krishna. and when they go to attack other kings and they happen to be vaishnava kings mayur dhwaj chandra has oh okay okay you know, all these people so the rajasi right. yagya right yeah so kshatriya because they are kshatriyas even two virtuous people can have a battle with each other and okay. that is how the shastras beautifully depict even even in the contemporary history in the 15th 16th century the great krishna devaraya was a vaishnava from madhva sampradaya and then our uh, pratap rudra yeah, was inspired by shankaracharya and lord chaitanya but they also battled against each other yes that's true hmm? so overall if uh, so that means there is a certain aspect of human nature itself which will which will lead to some kind of violence yeah prakriti you may say more than human human are controlled by nature prakriti and prakriti will time to time you know make people battle with each other oh okay yeah you know that when we say prakriti will make krishna does talk about prakriti kriyamanani at one level the gita that prakriti is doer but then there is if we see in the mahabharat in the udyoga parva before the gita is spoken in the bishwa parva there is a lot of discussion about whether we should fight or not yeah so just because fighting is to some extent unavoidable doesn't legitimize any and every form of fighting so therefore therefore if you see the virtue what is the difference between a virtuous war and adharmic war now unfortunately war has become a business unfortunately yes. that Nothing is the biggest that. difference between the war which was fought 
you know in the pages of the mahabharat and the modern war well it's a uh, okay so yeah. sorry i mean i appreciate your point i think the us president eisenhower after second world war he said that famous statement that you know we have to be very alert about the military industrial complex hmm. so now there are two things over here and in war as business at one level uh, most of the times when people fought war even in the past let's put the epics aside it was to gain wealth and prosperity hmm. 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 power hmm. prosperity there could be multiple motives but one of them was definitely power and prosperity so that and say today when people some people want to get wealthy maybe there the kshatriyas wanting to get wealthy now it is vaishyas wanting to get wealthy by causing wars among people or whatever hmm. so so money drives everyone throughout human history at one level hmm. so yeah. may, is the key difference that those who are going to say the beneficiaries of the war don't really take their own lives or their own efforts in the actual fighting is that the key difference no another yeah, that is all that is very interesting point what you said is right one another key difference is whenever the two states would be in the attacking mode one of the core principle is to create a you know, peace they would try they would work hard to create a peace either the lawyer or the mantri would go and try to talk to them and try to avoid the war and there was no middlemen who were like provoking the two countries to go on war but today unfortunately where certain agenda certain lobby they are consciously facilitating one country from other country to create a war so that they can be purely benefited commercially beyond the state benefited at least when two states would come and fight with each other at least one state would make some profit where the states are not making a profit those who are provoking the states they are and they end up making more profit at the cost mm-hmm. of these two countries the countries don't become winner the lobby the arm lobby becomes the winner that's in that's very important point that that actually it is in one sense if we take a human nature or material nature prakriti as then the greed will be one force which is always there mm. or the but it is as you said that who is benefiting yeah. so is the state anyway benefiting so in the past now if you can we can look at the vedic or dharmic history of the epics and then look at human history in general uh generally whenever wars were there there was always some kind of plunder happening mm. and whether it was jangis khan who came from mongolia or whether the arabic invaders came from mm, uh, came from the from from the indian perspective from the west or even the alexander came mm. so one of the main impetuses for war is uh, is to plunder and to gain wealth because war involves some expenses and then who is going to risk their lives unless they feel that the gain that they are going to that they may get is going to be much more than the possible loss or risk mm. so if we talk about uh, the basic psychology so one i could say you could say that now it is war is being systematically as you said instigated mm. by people from behind their various lobby groups and things like that in in war terminology they have this term of doze and hawks Mm. hawks are in the government and the media and the business who actually incite war mm. and there are those who want to avoid the war mm. so every country has certain dow dow like pe- people and certain hawk like people mm. so one of the things is that if i i i've been studying a little bit of history of the war so it seems that the idea of civilians fighting in war there are three mm. things there are like warriors fighting with warriors which is mm. broadly what happened in kurukshetra mm. then second is warriors may attack a kingdom mm. and they may even plunder uh, plunder the cities and maybe even rob i mean plunder from the c- civilians mm. but a third is civilians directly being engaged in fighting civilians conscripted for fighting mm. so the second the first seems to be exceptional and even 
that you know only warriors fighting with warriors and civilians being consciously protected hmm. so even in indica which is written by megasthenes who came with alexander he said that this was something distinctive we find in the wars in india that there was a lot of effort made to protect indians protect civilians rather hmm. so that was one aspect maybe you can comment on that but i just mentioned the three categories so first yeah, is what... this one hmm. civil so civilians being consciously protected hmm. second is civilians may be plundered but just as a means of gaining uh, some some victory some spoils from the war hmm. and the third is civilians being conscripted into war hmm. that civilians are forced to take up weapons and fight the third thing seems to have happened from uh, relatively from the 18th century napoleon bonaparte from his time onward the third thing happened so we'll discuss the third maybe first you uh, want to comment on the first second things then we'll go to third yeah so it's a very very important point you made about these three kinds of war if you see yesterday two days back somebody asked this question what was the fault of bhishma fighting on behalf of the kauravas since he was loyal to the throne of hastinapur and pandavas had become allies with drupad who was an enemy of the kuru hmm. so why krishna did not appreciate the rashtra dharma of bhishma dev and instigated the pandavas to beat bhishma dev by bringing shikandi and killing him krishna should have appreciated the dharma of yudhishthir you know and then appreciated the dharma of bhishma dev why would he do that so that is the important question and the answer is there in the mahabharata itself because in those time you would not invade the country you would, you would invade the king okay uh, it's an important principle to understand you would invade the king and the kurus had become adharmic so dharma took a higher position than the rashtra also Hmm, and no king no king would ever control another kingdom so the question of invading forces coming and taking your land and people non existed therefore krishna's interest fighting with bhishma was not connected to taking away land from him rather fighting bhishma was connected to bhishma was supporting adharma Hmm. therefore when when jarasand was killed you know it is not a surprise that lord krishna made jarasand the son only the king it is not a big news oh my god you know after killing him still made his son as the king forget that the britishers also mostly applied the same principle rather than controlling the entire kingdom of course they used for the wrong reason they hmm. made a pawn you know the kings of i would not want to name different kings they made them the pawn but there was also certain intelligence idea because the local people as long as they were ruled by their own king it didn't bother them the britishers are actually controlling my king mm, even in the yes. case of i think can say rupa goswami sanatan goswami that was one reason why nawab husain shah wanted yes. local bengalis to rule yes, or, or yes. at least be a part of the administration something little bit different but yeah that is the the, the same principle is applied you know so therefore no king would ever want to control other kingdom chanakya also explains in artha shastra but now unfortunately what happens is that the foreign force a foreign force is not necessarily coming from you know outside your borders even for that matter if there is a tamil guy ruling maharashtra you know then that will create lot of anger frustration in the local people right you know okay aurangzeb, so regionalism is so aurangzeb ruling delhi will always be seen wrong because at the end of the day he does not belong to this side you know it does not belong to this soil sharad pawar i am taking his name right we will not discuss anything he gave his party rashtrawadi congress party for what 
because he couldn't take he didn't mind making friendship with sonia gandhi but he couldn't take sonia gandhi becoming a prime minister no that's a known story you know it's it's yeah, a yeah, story yeah, so, not that i don't understand what is the point you are making is the point people I'm won't make... accept rulership by some outsider yeah so that always the king realized so they went for an extra resources what was there in the kingdom not at the cost of stealing the resources from people and making their country prosperous human ordinary citizens death would be a big burden to the enemy king also he couldn't handle that therefore he chose to fight only the soldiers not the civilians because that sensitivity that morality was there okay no so okay so now there are two three levels you could say one is the moral level another is also the functional level both because morality cannot be uh, uh, against the principle of functional level also they are interconnected the oh, moral okay. it is not functional it becomes a museum piece oh okay makes sense it's a poetic it's a fictional one oh okay then this this leads to a lot of questions i think we'll come to later but uh, so so if a king is going to of any aggressive power is going to not uh, take into consideration the fact that people are that people don't want to be ruled by outsiders mm. then they will themselves be courting a lot of trouble mm. so so in that sense you are saying the functional and the ethical will work together so mm. that is one aspect or uh, so is it in one sense uh, even if i am because you could say the western history is much more documented in other parts of the world that's why i am referring to western history it is also documented but you know even in the west they had this idea of what they call as noblus eglis that means the nobility has a duty to the community mm. and they have to give charity and they have to take care of the people who are their subjects mm. so even if there was a king under the king there would be what in india we might call tahsildars and things like that mm. and the king would not so it was even if the king would conquer a particular particular region it is often the ruling house of that place they would like uh, submit to or commit to that particular king and they would continue to have their sovereignty i think that that is yeah. a common sense actually that was the more common people if you like again in the mahabharat what was the difference between yudhishthira maharaj's uh, region uh, as uh, reign as the chakravarti as against jarasan wanted to come jarasan wanted to capture every king and destroy him Hmm. He wanted to establish direct connect with the king uh, kingdom of the other uh, region also, right? Okay. So he wanted to have a centralized power, and Yudhishthira Maharaj was a centralized inspiration. No. Okay. So so that is the common sense how it all always function. Okay. So at we can say. at one level if we want to discuss the difference between the right and wrong war or that kind of thing independent of the ethical character of the person itself yes we could look at their actions yeah whom are they targeting yeah and say if they are plundering the civilians yeah then definitely then that is then that is considered to be wrong yeah so now that now you mentioned about rashtra rashtravad and rashtra being about dharma you know one of the one of the prominent uh, thoughts mm. in modern political philosophy is that much war is caused because of nationalism mm. so for example i talk about napoleon being able to galvanize the common people for fighting mm. so that happened after the french revolution when the nobility was brought out was brought down the kings were brought down royalty was brought down and then he said that this is a matter of french pride so and then after that hitler also came and before that of course, of course there are first world war was there but the point is that in modern in the modern mind nationalism is often seen as a bad thing because it will lead to war 
and because europe experienced two two big wars that's why one of the reasons is that they tried to have a european union mm. where we all are together so now i one place i heard that national there's a difference between we could say nationalism and fascism that nationalism is my country is special and fascism is my country is supreme mm. so but overall this idea of rashtra dharma or rashtra rashtra bhakti rashtra prem mm. uh, to what extent did that play a role in fighting because in the indian independence struggle that was quite a prominent uh, factor yeah so again again if you go back take the example of bhishma dev it was never a concern for a king fighting other king you know enhancing using the spirit of my nation and inspiring his people rightly or wrongly to attack other kingdom that was never an issue it was always in regards to i cannot stand this king because he is doing adharma now i want to expand my influence over other place not to control administratively because you couldn't because the globalization was non existent in the very first place psychologically people did not accept because they naturally accepted the diversity okay so that was not there so again during the second or oh, independent struggle if you see interestingly as but much sorry, as i didn't get your first point exactly yeah. means you are saying that nationalism was not a factor because of this or? yeah not a, it was not a factor you never fought a war based upon nationalistic idea you fought the war based upon dharma and adharma idea you fought the king you did not fight the kingdom okay are you, yeah so, so, so now i'm just thinking then then say when one king wants to become a chakravarti yeah at that time also the fight is against the other king yeah and it is it is that king who becomes the emperor not necessarily that kingdom becomes the emperor yeah you know that king become emperor and he doesn't control into the day to day administration of the enemy king okay you know never gets involved into their system whether it is religion whether it is philosophy whether it is the resources never gets involved first okay. of all first of all the transportation was also that kind of transportation what we expect okay i want to ship you know 50000 uh, mango trees from india to london you couldn't do that right mm. so most of the most of the resources were local grown for the locals only so what are you fighting for in the 18th century or in the 17 to 18th century the gold was priced at 15 rupees per tola really yeah <laughs> oh in you know, the first time india experience that taking away your resources there is a the british government passed the forest law first them they declared that forest belong to the state and after that before that law was passed in a village less than 10 trees were cut after the british government passed that law they were cutting almost 10000 trees in the same village and taking those wood to london to british empire so they changed the entire concept of ruling mm. you know destroying the resources of one place and shipping it to another place and why it was possible because the psychologically the war principle changed and because of the modern technology the transportation became possible you could imagine okay i can pick up from here and ship it to another place mm. you okay. know so that also means even if say people like ibrahim lodi or others invaded india yeah. and sacked india that that uh, that plunder was temporary uh, because how much can you carry where will you carry Mm. and you know, some of them they decided rather than taking it to that country only let me settle here only yes that's true so therefore however brutal islamic invasion is islamic invasion gives you anger but you know the british invasion is much more dangerous 
Yes, it's subtler. It's no? more insidious. Yeah, yeah, insidious. It, in one sense, this Islamic invasion did not really disrupt. You could say the socio-economic systems. No, it, it was. There might possible. have been some religious persecution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Islamic invasion is fully focused on religious principle only. Nothing but that. No, purely most of it. Most of it. Okay. Interesting. Now, of course, most of it means uh, they they obviously wanted wealth, but but one the primary motivating factor was was religion. See, hmm. that's what if they wanted wealth, if they had taken the wealth, where is Ghori kingdom? Where is Ghazni kingdom? Where is Persian kingdom? Only till the oil came to Persia, Iran. Now, now they are showing their glory because of that. Otherwise, prosperity like how the British Empire. the spanish empire the portuguese empire you can clearly see the wealth is looted from another place only you know the british parliament's gold the british bank ka jo paisa hai the money you can easily statistically prove there you know, is mm. will durant in the in the in, in, in the case for india in his book he gives mm. statistically proven records you know so that became a different ball game altogether in regards to war otherwise yes. it was it was totally it was totally non existent hmm? okay so here what we are discussing is that i mean i talk about these three levels of uh, war so civilians being plundered you can say even within that there are two levels one is like like temporary plunder and the other is more like a permanent devastation by taking yeah. away the sources of livelihood itself yeah 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 so it seems that, uh, like no matter how brutal the muslims were uh, islamic invaders were but it, it was like the uh, i believe the british who cut off the thumbs of lakhs of uh, what uh, hand weavers in bangla in bangladesh and that part of bengal because they wanted cloth to be manufactured in manchester and therefore therefore the colonization like i was somebody asked me a question from the former russian country a small country in the eastern europe and i will not take the name of that country small country and this lady asked this question former russian she said as far as i understand in this story the west is a greater culprit because we are not defining this person is culprit and this person is not culprit in the modern mm. world you can only choose who has a greater intensity of being a culprit yes it's a good so for her her point was a uh, putin is a uh, uh, the the biden and european world is a greater uh, uh, villain than putin yeah i said are you are you are you are from former russia communist country and you went through lot she said yes because there were some people who were used like stalin for that matter stalin was you know he killed more people compared to hitler but because yes. stalin was from the allied forces he is part of the america uk forces during the second world war so his hand even though more bloody than hitler you know is covered with a jersey milk yeah and even if he gets even if he gets a bad name he only gets the bad name for killing the ukrainians that time the russians the russians whom he killed were none other than the ukrainians only so russia gets the bad name for killing the ukrainians even though the stalin was part of the western forces friendship that's very interesting of course from what i have read you know hitler because he killed at that time during the war through concentration camps mm. and the west knew about it because eventually they came to germany mm. but stalin he also treated a 
treated uh, i mean prisoners of war quite brutally and other things but much of his brutality happened afterwards once the iron curtain had fallen so it took a long time for people to come to know and the gulags which he, he had were actually worse than in many ways worse than concentration camps also but then people didn't come to know about it much because it it was not a active war center where other people could come in and uh, come in and see what was happening yeah, and then, but 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 i'm still saying but you are right you are right that is all correct but see the narratives yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I both this, but, both also, are criminals yeah yeah okay both Perfect. are equal criminals both are yes. equal criminals but the point is hitler becomes a greater criminal and in the crime of hitler stalin some other escapes from the crime yes you know that that way it seems that uh, once the it became clear that the world war 2 was going to be won then all three uh, uk america and uh, ussr uh, russia at that time they were all jockeying to try to portray how they are the biggest dogs in the fight mm. and even it says that uk bombed certain cities in like dresden and some cities in germany which were completely civilian cities with no military uh, military camps and they bank them just to show that we can also be brutal mm-hmm. now of course this is all political and there can be different narratives so some people say that even that america knew that pearl harbor was going to be attacked but they didn't intervene because then they would have a excuse to enter into the war and eventually they dropped the bomb because they just wanted to show that we can also have a lot of power so we can also be brutal now i don't want we, we don't want as i said we don't want to get into uh, specifics of who is bad but the fact that like you said earlier somebody is more culpable somebody is less culpable everybody is culpable but a narrative will paint somebody as uh, somebody as good and somebody is bad and therefore unfortunately in modern people try to use the modern logic to study the mahabharata and rama and, and saying that the victors are the one who write history you know yes. it's, it it falls apart because this logic cannot be applied to this kind of war because ram was not interested in collecting the resources of lanka in fact he did not even enter into lanka which king would not want to go and see the conquered country That's right amazing he did not even enter into lanka the pandavas not only perform all the last rites of their enemies but they went to beg forgiveness from dhritarashtra and spent lots of money to perform their last rites so the point was they said it's a reluctantly we have to kill but we will not celebrate the death of your sons rather we beg forgiveness from you So the first thing krishna did for the pandavas bring them back to the kauravas uh, bring back back to the kauravas family okay so you this know? again brings that the fight is against a king so yeah. once that king is removed our yeah. fight is not against your entire dynasty or against your entire kingdom so yeah. there is a time, there may be a time for fighting but as soon as that fighting is over then there is a time for reconciliation yeah and therefore the nas- the present nationalism is a hype town is a oh. is very hyped hype okay nation. yeah very hype where where you are you know you take one issue and beat it very badly repeatedly again and again mm-hmm. again and again you deal with people's emotions all right so therefore what happens in the emotional people they see the entire country which is not their country to be the enemy mm. so, you know it is not the pakistan is our enemy the theology of pakistan the political ideology of pakistan is not only the enemy of india but it is the enemy of their own country also mm, that is true you know and therefore the indian soldier if you talk to any you know highly decorated soldier they say it is very interesting you will never find a soldier they are fierce in the battle but they are sensitive in regards to relationship between they as a soldier family and the others as a soldier family the civilians don't understand 
the civilians want the civilians who are who are you know aggressively nationalistic have a greater desire for causing destruction even though they can't chase a dog in their street that's true you know uh, actually this this point about people not having personal animosity there are accounts in european wars also like when christmas would come the germans and the french they put aside their fighting and they celebrated for that night of christmas and then they again picked up their fights so what we hear about say arjuna visiting the uh, duryodhana's camp in the evening so that is not that utopian in that sense yes and 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 therefore 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 you know as prabhupad mentions the common man if he is given little knowledge he is more sensitive a common soldier i am saying he is more sensitive to understand the dynamics of war compared to a politician and his followers hmm. who thrive on a wrong ideology are hum pakistan ko khatam kar dete hum china ko khatam kar dete hum hindustan ko khatam kar dete na america ko khatam kar dete the problem is not the people because at the end of the day at the end of the day it is you know the human nature will always remain the same from the satyayuga to kaliyuga that will not change but depending on what kind of narratives we build you know therefore when people say oh you say, sorry just wait when you say yeah. human nature will not change over the yugas yeah. so what we can say is that maybe the percentage of people who are of a more demoniac nature or more uh, godly nature that may vary but overall there will always that 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 you two two side and everybody will have two side not any no particular community will be entirely yeah. demoniac yeah, yeah, is that what yeah. you're saying yes 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 you know okay. so therefore i always says don't don't kill people kill the ideology Mm-hmm. adharma should be attacked just like in the 16th chapter again it's fascinating how krishna right on the battlefield of kurukshetra he could have instigated arjuna discussing the name of demonic forces in the 16th chapter is rare on the battlefield but he does not discuss the name of the people he discusses the principle of demonic nature yeah is that such a powerful point you know that you know those who say that krishna spoke the gita to fight a war to get arjuna to fight a war that's such a superficial understanding because if that was his purpose he didn't have to spill the whole bhagavad gita he can just describe dropadi's being dishonored yeah and that would have made arjuna's blood boil enough to get him to fight yeah. so he is talking more about universal principles of living you know about how to deliberate on dharma rather than just get arjuna to fight yeah so therefore the third kind of war what you mentioned you know this commercial lobby they are act- actually in a worse than hiranyakashipu and hiranyaksha in regards to intensity may not be in regards to power you know okay yeah in regards to intensity they have actually no sensitivity because they do not see anything on the real front what happens if they see they will not be able to bear they are focused on making their bucks millions and millions and millions and millions of rupees yeah that's true so so in one sense uh, so the difference between when i said that war always had a monetary element to it but war being driven by monetary considerations solely where ordinary people are almost motivated indoctrinated conscripted into war yeah that is where it becomes especially mercenary yeah mercenary okay. same thing same thing religious war also the religious okay, war so, sorry also. even before we go into religion just one question about this see that at one level we can say that one country may have a lot of hype and they may evoke nationalistic fervor and get them to attack other country like say germany nazi germany did for, they will attack the whole world but then quite often there is uh, 
resistance to it that also comes because of nationalistic fervor itself mm. that means say if a particular country is is engaging its common people to fight mm. then the other country will its army alone will not be able to defend so then invoke like involving common people in fighting mm. isn't that a necessary thing say for example with with at least with respect to the current war mm. it seems in ukraine lot of uh, lot of civilians are either aiding in the war effort or directly joining the war so and then they say that this what they call is asymmetrical war mm. because you know when army has to fight with civilians they can be brutal but now how much can they fight mm. so civilians getting involved is it something like uh, we eventually if a thorn has gone and we need a thorn to take it out but ideally civilians should not be involved if you see i was asking this question to somebody will you ever think indian army would ever want ordinary civilians to fight on the forefront of the battleground that's an insult of their valor and their training and their education they would never give the weapons to ordinary people the ordinary people would be involved in giving certain messages information i think during the 1971 or you know 65 battle there were some uh, ordinary shuffles in the rajasthan area they knew every part of the you know desert and they would measure the 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 dent of the Uh, of this sand and realize whether who has gone from here and this people give lot of information to indian army so that way according, just oh, like okay. on the mahabharat yes mahabharat when duryodhana was hiding yeah, they, yeah that that also and in the mahabharat okay when you read carefully other than arjuna nobody had the inexhaustible quiver so there is a description of people carrying weapons in their bullock cart and providing to the main hero no so they were not touched they were not killed the max where people would be killed was a chariot driver but the suppliers of the weapons were not killed oh you know so they were also in one sense considered civilians they were also considered as civilians even though they were working in the war providing the weapons but they never attacked about, them but what about spies and espionage like at one level we know that lord ram let uh, who are those uh, uh, demons from uh, from ravana's army would come to investigate his army he let them go yeah. and the ramayan say that that was like an act of mercy hmm. so was that the norm or that was not the norm no espionage were espionages were basically more than the secret agents the inside people who are like uh, you know drohi of the rashtra okay you know yeah they were basically chanakya in his uh, in his uh, arthashastri explain somebody's uh, betrayal for the cause of rashtra you know he would not kill them they would have a tattoo on their forehead rashtra drohi <laughs> you know for the rest of their life they would stay alive but they couldn't face the public he did not kill them he said don't kill them oh okay. so tattoo their face with rashtra droha no okay so the uh, so you are saying that if civilians are involved hmm. that's not only bad for civilians but it's also bad for the army because that means the army is incompetent enough to yeah not yeah. competent enough to actually fight yeah yeah so but uh, say now this asymmetric warfare where say even shivaji maharaj him primarily won by we could say guerrilla warfare because hmm. his army was very small as compared to say aurangzeb's army hmm. so now this question comes up sometimes they say that do the ends do the ends justify the means hmm. so now in a, in a kurukshetra war we could say although the pandavas were outnumbered but still the pandavas had great heroes among them hmm. but it is a direct face to face battle but does uh, a dharma yuddha necessarily mean it has to have a face to face battle because in one sense uh, while it's a strength while it's a matter of skill and strength but it's also there are there are military strategies take the opponent by surprise attack them 
and ambush them so this is also a part of real politic so would a dharmic war not involve all these things it was again it was all dip- up up in the therefore when the battlefield of kurukshetra they made rule no these are the rules for fighting and the pandavas broke it in the beginning only you know in one sense because you know whom are you fighting with you are fighting with the kauravas who were through and through evil forces according to vyasadev so using certain methodology to bring them down was like bringing shikhandi in front of vishwadev right killing bhurishtra from behind and then uh, you know making bhish bhib our dronacharya hearing the lie right and krishna coming and taking that uh, weapon of uh, brad uh, what is it them or uh, yeah duryodhan yeah. had got abhishma yeah, to make yeah. this fire arrows yeah yeah so therefore 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 the point is when the battle become intense then both the parties again the both the parties use certain means which are not common practice when you are living a normal life hmm. but even And among is, sorry sorry just interrupt but even among various forms of questionable practices so was abhimanyu's killing uh, especially brutal yeah because when arjuna says sorry yeah yeah it was especially brutal because you know they were like they were mean you know they were mean they they, they and then the people who were involved that was a problematic dronacharya was involved krupacharya was involved bhurishra was involved at least they should have taken certain stand against this okay hmm. so in one sense uh, in a war we could say that there are certain things which may be questionable but then again it's a matter of of brutality will also have its degrees yeah so ashwatthama's yeah. killing sleeping people was completely out of the pale yeah yeah hmm. so so now we we have been discussing so getting civilians involved so so rashtra prem or rashtra rashtravad or nationalism so you are saying that it was it was it was it was not the factor that led to wars or yes. it was not used in the past to cause wars yeah very clear that we have to be very clear okay yeah so then was there a kind of nationalist consciousness as such that or rashtra prem and uh, because then if we see that the, 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 the kurus was there rashtra prem for their kuru kingdom or was that for the entire bharat varsha or what was the conception of rashtra and rashtra prem at that time see see again therefore there is a description about your place like there is a conflict between shalya and karna and karna condemns the people from madhradesh yes right and then eventually shalya retaliates karna by saying that good and bad are existing everywhere you cannot take an entire country and define based upon few wrong habits practiced by some people of that state so shalya gives a very beautiful answer to karna because karna is putting everybody in one basket and condemning one state after another state you know mm. madras people are like this bahalikas are like this and these people are like that right so there could be a there could be a certain variation in regards to behavior so when you compare this behavior to that behavior you may appear that you are your culture is superior to other culture but you'll always find good people bad people in between in all civilization so to make a black and white about about your race or your space is not at all beneficial right so what was the rashtra which became the meeting point for the uh, means means the pride point for the bhartiya rashtra it was not the it was not the physical thing it was a cultural thing oh ganga oh yamuna 
ஓ காவேரி ஓ துங்கபத்ரா so they define their connection based upon the rivers rather than based upon the place okay no it's a cultural nationalism so so cultural as contrasted to the political are you saying that way yeah. yes yes yeah so so river you are saying as a representation of a culture yes Yeah, because most civilizations were, were built around rivers, yeah, and rivers yeah. were also considered sacred. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. And therefore, therefore, if you study, when somebody takes Upanishad and Samskar, it is interesting that you invoke all the rivers in that water where you use for Achman, Ganga, Chaiva, Yamuna, Chaiva, Narmada, Sindhu, Kaveri. சரஸ்வதி ஜலோஸ்மின் சந்நிதிம் குரு ஸோ கல்ச்சரல் யூ ஆர் இன்வைட்டிங் ஆல் தட் ரிவர் யூ ஆர் ஃப்ரம் தமிழ் பெல்ட் ஆன் த பேங்க் ஆஃப் திருச்சனாப்பள்ளி ஆர் காவேரி பேங்க் பட் யூஆர் சிட்டிங் ஆன் த காவேரி பேங்க் அண்ட் யூஆர் இன் மோக்கிங் கங்கா ஆல்சோ விச் இஸ் ஃப்ரம் நார்த் இந்தியா அண்ட் யூஆர் சிட்டிங் இன் ஹிமாலயாஸ் ஏனோ ஃப்ளோயிங் கங்கா ரிவர் தேர் யூ ஆர் இன் மோக்கிங் வாட்டர் விச் இஸ் காவேரி விச் இஸ் நர்மதா விச் இஸ் சரஸ்வதி you know so therefore it was more of a cultural reality it oh so when the rivers so what you're saying is when the rivers are invoked it is not necessarily the river in only one's own region yeah you are invoking you are sitting in himalayas and invoking kaveri you are sitting on the bank of kaveri invoking ganga nadi also so that could be a that could also be a good indicator of a that there was a although there might be smaller kingdoms Hmm. but there was still an awareness that there was a broader land of dharma yeah so very much called aryavarta or something like that yeah so therefore when pandavas had to travel when daumya rishi talked about which place they it is specially when arjuna was in the heavenly planet for 5 years they traveled so that time he took them to all the four direction of bharat bhumi and first he explained all the tirthas if you want to know the bharat the pandavas actually traveled all the four corners oh okay yeah, yeah you know and through the rivers whether ramanuja whether is lord chaitanya whether shankaracharya whether madhvacharya whether vishnu swami whether vallabhacharya you know what they did they went up to sindhu nadi mhm so when we say that they went up the badrika ashram to the himalayas yeah kuvera skin and other things that is outside the domain that is that is beyond the earthly domain but so beyond some of them they went but i am saying just taking from the historical perspective they do not the the other worldly perspective they went shankaracharya went up to kashmir also oh okay so now now at that time definitely Uh, UN Sang and others had come so they knew that there was there was lands beyond it yeah Imp- yeah empirical geography also had that knowledge yeah 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 so that that makes things clear so now when we t- so there was a national consciousness but that was not we could say weaponized yeah that is the point now you got it right very okay. good yeah that was not used for military you know conquering so it's interesting in the modern times there is this idea that culture that nationalism when it is uh, national so we saying nationalism is not the problem the way it is being used is the problem yeah so but, yeah. so then what is the purpose of nationalism is nationalism is a tool for spiritual consciousness or cultivating dharmic awareness nationalism, or what nationalism national aim is a tool for ability to govern specific area <coughs> no king no royalty no system has the power to control you know the entire world and create a proper governance it is not possible you cannot sit in white house and you decide okay from white house we can manage properly entire world It doesn't work like that therefore the simple principle is that in regards to governance you can manage only this much 
you know so therefore mm-hmm. it's 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 like your your capacity to handle this much of area so that you can provide proper infrastructure proper administration proper facility for your citizen and therefore indra indra is known as purandara the word purandara is connected to breaking the cities so that that city that place whatever pura can be managed properly by the local leader you call him king you call him patel you call him patel whatever you want to call if it was unmanageable by the very power of the uh, you know inefficiency he would divide it into another kingdom so that it can be ruled properly the pure reason for nationalism is nothing but administration oh so so it was not seen so the idea of nation being an object of worship hmm? Hmm. that is also not there so much like certain dhams are of course considered sacred yeah but uh, like the idea of matra bhumi and then like rashtra bhakti is that a relatively a modern modern concept that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying if you see you would worship this place the place of ganga the place of jamuna the place of and therefore you would worship bharat because it's a collection of many tirthasthan it's a punya bhumi it is punya bhumi not because i am on the difference between the cultural rashtriyata and the political rashtriyata is the political rashtriyata begins with i because i am mm. born here and the cultural rashtriyata begins begins with that space oh this is the this is the pure this is the pavitra sthan i need to worship i am not the center that place is the center no therefore therefore for an indian for an indian rashtriyata is connected to culture so we have to be careful what kind of nationalism you are condemning mm. uh, i give this i give this simple example especially when the american people they took to the path of spirituality and when the nationalism was basically challenged they were happy to be disconnected to that nationalism because that means there is a guilt of establishing that country at the cost of killing millions of local red indians the philosophy of i am not this body i am the spirit soul i am not american i not indian it became very strongly connected to their heart okay they could easily identify no but i am not an american so for me to say you should not be connected to the ideology of india you know yes the political india i understand but the cultural india you cannot disconnect from me because that is, is it, my that yeah. Yeah, i mean i appreciate this point of so then it depend are this political and cultural are it is it more conceptual or is it more functional uh, but that means because if we see even in europe as compared to america but much more in europe mm-hmm. they have um, they have very diverse cultures in each country mm-hmm. like say the uh, in america also you can say new york and uh, texas have di- diverse diversity mm-hmm. but it's not as much as they're not not different languages Mm-hmm. in europe each country has its own language mm-hmm. and quite distinctive cultures are there mm-hmm. so when they formed the they had this i think westminster treaty and everything mm-hmm. uh, uh, that time they said that you know, because we will make these states secular mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so state secular means that that we will cooperate for for political administrative purposes mm. and the cultures were okay so they removed religion but
but instead mm. of religion the basis all of their cultural differences you are saying that eventually political factors overrode the cultural differences yeah you know cultural diversity i would say yeah. so cultural diversity was there but once the once there were people who wanted to conquer then so that way like even in india some in some parts the right now i say west bengal tried to weaponize the bengali bengali could say rashtriya not rashtriya that whatever it is regionalism against the rest of india hmm. or there are some things like that happening in tamil nadu to some extent yeah tamil thai against hindi and things like that so that to an extreme degree may happen so the cultural diversity does not have to lead to political conflict yeah because now south indians worship the if you see from that perspective why should a north indian god from ayodhya who is strongly based in ayodhya be worshiped in the srirangapatnam in tamil nadu you know that is not existing no so, you so so you are saying that that was not an issue only nobody said or why should i worship north indian god ram to north indian hai krishna is north indian hai so because there ram are, was not considered north indian is that what you are saying because the culturally his character was so endearing to you it didn't matter where he belong to that was not an issue only i am just making an assumption if that was an issue they could have made it strong issue or why should we worship now the the unfortunately this dmk politics would make that kind of claim oh we don't want to worship ram because he is from the higher community he he oppressed but then somebody said are ravan to you want to worship ravan he said yes he because he is a south indian but he is a brahmana then he is higher than ram in regards to caste oh okay yeah you know, so that was not an issue only there had a they had a greater maturity in regards to handling limitless diversity you know and appreciating that idea and moving forward mm. you know, the concept of nationhood political nationhood is nothing but given by the modern western world and now they are only saying oh because of this nationalism you know it's a problem and all these people who speak about anti nationalism uh, against the concept of nation they all stay in a very safe guarded town just like those who claim like this so called liberal women from the from the film industry they talk about uh, adventure they talk about fearlessness they talk about being there they are you are traveling with 15 guards with you however adventurous however blunt you speak you are not in the real world the real world the real girls in the real world don't have the security guard the parents have to provide proper care and concern where you are going what you are doing what time you are coming back mm-hmm. you know she is vulnerable so therefore when the vulnerability increases caused by some outside forces then more political nationalism will come into existence as simple as that okay so overall so the so the point you are making here is that uh, there is uh, there, there is a significant in the western world also and increasingly in india there is a big big you could say divide between the not just like the corporate elite but also the intellectual elite mm. and the rest of society mm. so one one maybe we could uh, it is a this slightly different topic but in today's world the intellectual elite seems to think that you know if we just have good policies and if we have good uh, governance and wars will not happen at all mm. and that's a, that, that they said you know if we just have better social administration then we can defund the police so but that didn't work at all and now the same people who said defund the police are saying we need to fund the police in america so so in one sense uh, defense and uh, deterrence through defense mm. will always have some importance yes very much like some uh, just to make it more specific like uh, till 1975 or so 191980 roughly we could say that there have been some multiple wars between india and china india and pakistan but once all three countries acquired nuclear weapons then there have been no open wars yeah so similarly 
we could say that there are two global powers but there was no major war between the soviet bloc and the usa because again there were, were nuclear powers so nuclear power was there on both sides so in that sense saying that too much money is being spent on defense and you should not spend so much money that is somewhat unrealistic yeah, that will that will never work that logic will never be implemented therefore when we sometime as a spiritualist we talk about in a human mind become more evolved spiritually there will be no war at all they are basically consciously unconsciously you know saying mahabharat war happened because of the non evolved mind they are basically consciously unconsciously saying krishna you know should have not done like this no that's the nature the foundational principle of life even the two vaishnavas will fight against each other and they have fought against each other in the mahabharat also and also in the in the modern context also mm. so just like sometime two temples fight with each other in regards to you know their <laughs> zones also okay <laughs> it is unavoidable it is not it is it is not it is not possible not to uh, you can you can pray let there be shanti therefore in the vedas there are so many shantri mantras why because we know we need this shanti mantras om shanti 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 for every part of the yajna when you do you basically chant shanti mantra om sahana bhavatu sahano bunantu sah viryam karva vahi tejasvina madita mastumam om shanti 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 hi you know mm. oh, everywhere om dau shanti antariksha shanti bhu shanti वनस्पति शांति विश्वदेव शांति ऐसे अलग अलग मंत्र है उसमें शांति की कामना इतना है वाई देर इज अ डिजायर फॉर शांति बिकॉज यू ऑल्सो नो द वर्ल्ड विल ऑल्सो हैव दिस कॉन्फ्लिक्ट समटाइम द राइट काइंड ऑफ कॉन्फ्लिक्ट समटाइम द रॉन्ग काइंड ऑफ कॉन्फ्लिक्ट द कॉन्फ्लिक्ट विल ऑलवेज बी देर दे फॉर सुरा एंड असुर युद्ध इज शाश्वत एंड इटर्नल ओके एंड लाइक इन द भागवतम ऑल्सो who is sura and asura that can sometimes become complicated also yes. so that may also happen conflict is going to be there always always that is and it. then so preparation has to be there now sometimes there is this discussion that you know so much of the uh, so much of the national budget is spent on defense uh, but uh, and that same thing could be used for other social welfare causes so now we do see that the kshatriyas in the past they had a significant level of opulence mm-hmm. they lived in they the pandavas had a grand palace and they had a grand sabha and their dresses and everything were also quite grand and it seems that their enemy was all that their army was also well equipped so are there some broad guidelines of a broad principles that uh, somebody may say that actually instead of spending the money on defense we can use it for so for social cause for social welfare but then if there is an attacker and if you are not uh, prepared then the cost might be much more eventually yeah so therefore one air force officer mentioned this to me you know he had taken to one one uh, station you know just uh, and uh, he explained to us he said look if the four major countries china america russia india right 10 countries he said 10 countries for one year if they do not spend on the defense budget the entire world could be facilitated with the best medical colleges best school and colleges best water system for everybody but then he said you know what nobody will do that nobody so nobody will, nobody will do that because when isolated discussion made by people with intellectual class they are speaking from what should be rather than what it is mm. so krishna he spoke bhagavad gita based upon the eternal principle of life this is how life is if you are good be smart also 
and the smart people will invest their wealth in regards to security also yeah that's that's essentially required mm -hmm. as i think as a common saying in uh, military it's probably a quote from some american president he says that the that the best way to have peace is to be ready for war yeah you know and therefore therefore krishna in one sense there is no direct verse like this but the essence of it it is that hum shanti ke upasak hai parantu yuddh ko hum upakaran bana sakte hain we are the we are the worshipper of peace but we use war as a tool for peace beautiful <laughs> war is not the goal but war is the tool for peace if people do not understand and if you give a spiritual talk purely spiritual talk you become totally irrelevant that is true oh there should not be war you know war is bad because people are not people are not spiritualist and the guy who is giving a talk he may had a fight with his fellow devotee also for some issue yeah. <laughs> most probably true, if not true. that day within eight days mm. you know so therefore therefore go back to your scriptural understanding accept the reality you know you know ukraine is right russia and right that political reality who is right who is not right you know one is more right one is less right one is more vicious and one is less vicious Mm. but either party from the modern perspective it's a and therefore kshemendra kavi from kashmir he after the end of the mahabharat war i think he wrote a kind of a poetry he depicts the conclusion of the war what is it the conclusion of war is that the dharmi people knew that nobody wins in war it's pain mm. for both the party but still war cannot be avoided that is the reality of human existence so huh? it's a so it's only thing is is that the that the consequences of war are terrible yeah but then possibly they are less terrible than the consequences of not fighting the war yeah this is the simple principle of war you know if you if you suggest i think i remember dalai lama you know one devotee told me i don't i have not seen it when i've been to that place there is a museum in pune it regards to shivaji maharaj's life and they invited dalai lama to inaugurate it huh? very strange very <laughs> very strange <laughs> he was invited and i am not i don't know but that's what he said because the person who attended the function here told me this and the lai lama said you know we lost our end without shooting a bullet hamara pura desh chala gaya so there was no violence in regards to the tibetans retaliating but there is a perpetual violence against the psychology of tibetans because they lost their entire country and they had to become you know migrant people to another place where it took it is taking a great deal of psychological instability yes so either you have one time war or you have a perpetual war so mahabharat talked about one time war and the tibetan spoke about perpetual war so it's and it's not just psychological war you know even there are dalai there are there are buddhist monks who do self immolation they yeah. burn themselves in protest yeah so, so there is that, there is a violence that's also violence in one sense and yeah, it's yeah. we can't really say that okay i'm not killing anyone else i'm killing myself but you're still killing you're taking life yeah. from mm. a statistical perspective the number of people who got killed because of this uh, unrest is there mm. that is true yeah so therefore oh. the good people or more dharmic leaning people you know rather than calling dharmic people in the modern world also more dharmic leaning people more human sensitive people 
even if they are forty percent compared to another country, sixty percent may be demonic forces. If they are forty percent, some dharmic values compared to somebody having thirty percent, I would say I would support the forty percent rather than saying both are rakshasas. You have to choose between the two rakshasas. Choosing a less rakshasa compared to bigger rakshasa. Hmm. And this is possibly where we can say spiritual practices or spiritual training can play a role. That if there is a spiritual culture and spiritual wisdom given, then there is a greater chance of a person who is more virtuous, more dharmically inclined, yeah. gaining power and being influential. Yeah. No. And therefore, the power will always be there. The power will always be there. War will always be there. Conflict will always be there. So who has the control over this conflict? That's the point. If there are more dharmi people having spiritual background, so they if they rule, then they would try to make war instead of eight days. They'll do it for three days. But the war has to be there. <laughs> you know, you know. True. So maybe just one one or two last questions because in Indian history, if you see. Uh, when shivaji maharaj he fought even at that time it was not that there was mass mobilization of people to join the war no so kshatriyas only fighting yeah isn't it uh, then say when if we consider when netaji subhash chandra bose he called upon people to join yeah at that time was it also mass mobilization or at that time also we can say people who actually join will be people who are kshatriya inclined only then what happened he basically took over the the prisoner of war which were captured by the japanese people indian people fighting on behalf of german also british, yeah british empire he took them and few people who were like you know if you ask if you ask a large number of indians about subhash chandra bose's army you know what was the number compared to what was the you know the population of india very minuscule but because their men of valor and few women were also there you know they fought the nationalistic pride was taken to another level only you know so that nationalism which subhash chandra it the space connected nationalism the land connected nationalism the politically connected nationalism otherwise you will not be able to fight the britishers the cultural nationalistic will not fight he will say it doesn't matter whether you know bangladesh is controlled by another country because i will get to go to my padma river to worship hmm? so therefore a cultural nationalistic also has to be politically alert hmm? it's interesting so we cannot although we should differentiate in terms of uh, nationalism not being cynically used by politicians yeah but still we cannot uh, like rigidly separate culture and politics cannot. now it is cannot it is the, the reality is this political nationalism is the is a reality in regards to being it being it in the forefront but if you are having a spiritual knowledge in your core of the heart you want to ask i again talk to another army officer he said you know what it's a very interesting if you talk to indian army officer who are well educated in regards to you know their professional field also and the and the context of itihas i have spoken to few of them they said you know what we don't fight for the land we fight for the intrusion of our culture and what is our culture our culture is atithi devo bhava ye hame atithi devo bhava ko chhodna padega if the intruder come again and again so we'll start suspecting our atithi i said wow He said that is the foundation. We want to invite the atithis, but along with the atithis, this rascal come. They have to beat them down. Hmm. So I mean, you know, there are like there will be various principles of dharma, and we cannot elevate one principle of dharma above everybody, everything else without considering uh, other factors. Yeah. Therefore, 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 the niti shastra and the artha shastra, along with the adhyatma shastra. become of paramount importance he what to push forth as the prominent agenda now the agenda but at this stage 
like krishna telling yudhishthira maharaj to tell a lie that became very prominent abhi jhoot bolna hi padega hmm. but that did not become the character of our yudhishthira maharaj okay so it's like uh, circumstantially something is done it is a great caution that it doesn't become the norm afterwards yes yes so therefore our nationalism is a cultural nationalism but today i also need to support the political nationalism but that is not the goal the goal will always be cultural nationalism because that is the foundation at the end of the day when dharma prevails because dharma will prevail i may not be there satya me vahi jayate the capitalism has to crumble the communism has to crumble the dharmic capitalism and dharmic communism when it prevails then then for that matter like uh, this one great astrologer pv narsingh rao those who are listening they can go and see his talk which has given about this ukraine and russian war very sensible very logical very interestingly presents what could happen this whole unrest will continue up to 2030 30 30 yeah not like this the war you know it's like what's happening now but the the conflict will continue up to 2030 and some countries you know the russia will be like italy china will be like a germany in regards to aggression in, during the second world war and eventually america will be like united kingdom the history tha unka are bahut bada rajya tha you know it will be like that <laughs> very nice analysis he has done and then he is speaking about dharma hmm interesting so in one sense uh, we can say that when prophecies are made about future there is there is a certain level of tentativeness about it but you could say there is also certain level of uh, broad direction we can get a sense of where things are moving also yeah so therefore he said it's not a predictable science you know jyotish shastra is not a predictable science it's an indicative science and because there are new karmas are happening and therefore it can take another twist also therefore no astrologer specially dealing with the global issue can say this will exactly happen that's a foundation of jyotish shastra whether it is for your chart or the chart of the globe it will always be like that therefore why would they a real educated jyotish shastragya will never take such a claim that you can write it down it will happen exactly like he will never do that claim. i think we should stop yes for yes we are very broad discussion i'll quickly try to summarize yeah and and i'm sure we can have one more discussion also on this topic sometimes yeah uh, further so today we discuss broadly about war from a dharmic perspective and in terms of causes of war it to say that the war is simply like virtuous attacking the vicious it is not always like that that like when the rajasvi against to be connect conducted and the virtue vaishnav king might also attack another vaishnav king but the big difference was that the war was fought against the king it was more like a test of skills and strength not against the civilians Yes, and it they certainly did not in, enlist the civilians per se. So that was the difference between say the Vishnu Maharaj becoming emperor and Jarasand, who tried to imprison the kings and sacrifice them, whereas the Vishnu Maharaj continued the legacy of whoever was ruling. Hmm. So, yeah. Uh, then we discussed about in modern times what has happened that getting getting civilians involved. or targeting civilians even when it happened say the muslims islamic invasion did that but that was in what was occasional mm. and and because of the nature of technology and the nature of resources wealth could not be so easily transported also mm. so many of them made india their home base itself and ruled over here but with with the british with the time of the industrial revolution it was not just plundering of wealth but devastation of the sources of wealth itself mm. which uh, yes. led to Uh, which which is where wars become more there always the wealth seeking element of war but the systematic destruction of economies by people who are interested only in money 
without any consideration of they incite war for monetary purposes alone that is something which is which is which is very dangerous in today's world so war becoming a big business yes. and then in that connection it discussed that and the, elaborately about nationalism yes. there's a difference between say political nationalism and cultural nationalism and the main difference is that in the in the vedic tradition the idea of the country or rashtra whether it is one's particular kingdom or state or the broader bharatvarsha the idea was more connected with culture that the river that one is connected with and the rivers that are a lot of part of aryavarta uh, so the idea was cultural and then gradually from that spiritual transformation but in modern time nationalism is weaponized to try to uh, to incite ordinary people uh, to fight and then that makes them paint the other side as completely evil yeah so that is where uh, then then the war becomes indiscriminate so wars that if at all that we fought it's one king one country fight, one head of state fighting another head of state mm. it's not one country fighting another country and not demonizing the all the citizens of that country mm. and then with respect to uh, some several remarkable points about how lord ram didn't even enter into lanka mm. or the pandavas they actually performed the last rite of even the kauravas mm. and so and then they reconciled with vitrashtra and gandhari so the idea is sometimes war is unavoidable and to think that as humanity evolves war will become impossible war will become war will not happen that is that is to consider that the Mah- people at the time of mahabharata and ramayana were not evolved mm. but what can be done is that if there are dharmically inclined people then they will minimize war mm. and even if war happens they will try to minimize the casualties minimize the extent of the war and to that extent if we we cultivate spiritual culture we we support a spiritual culture then then it is easier to have more dharmically inclined rulers mm. and so, so defense and deterrence are essential in the real world to minimize the possibility of war and we all have to be prepared and in today's world especially while cultural and political nationalism can be separated but at certain times the political aspect of nationalism may also be utilized but that mm. cannot be made the final goal yes the final purpose is ultimately to elevate people's consciousness and that can happen only through a culture and spirituality ultimately mm. so the purpose of war is to establish dharma and it is not to uh, establish a particular person in power or it is not to establish to dis- demonize or destroy a particular person mm. particular kingdom also So any in last points you would like to add you know that's a uh, lot to discuss yes it's something yeah thank you very much I look forward because to... because that's what i'm saying that the entire even that began by krishna only the sweetest of you know charming personality in regards to performing vrindavan leela but that same charming personality also has a tough he can suck the life of putana right because that is how life is yeah okay that's a beautiful starting point that we as we may want to live lovingly and uh, affectionately but we have to be he said be good but be real also don't be yes. naive yeah yes sure. okay. thank you very much thank you krishna